Burning Bridges, an Aliens fan fiction, written by Katherine Kruger, also known as Admiral Katz on fanfiction.net, at Sailing Bunny on Twitter, and The Sailing Rabbit on AVP Galaxy. Read by Katherine Kruger and edited by Donal Douglas. This story follows a different timeline to the current alien universe. Some characters have been changed to reflect this timeline. Chapter 1 June 2135. Message sent and received. To Mrs. Esmeralda Gorman, Deerfield, Massachusetts, USA, Earth. From Marshal Jethro Waits, Sevastopol Station, KG-348 Orbit, Zeta Reticuli System. Subject. Arrived at Sevastopol. I am. I arrived at Sevastopol a couple days ago. I'm sorry I didn't send a message as soon as I got here. Starting to see why everyone's saying I need assignments a little closer to Earth. I certainly never felt like I was getting older until coming out of cryo and my first instinct was to throw up, and I had a feeling of overall weakness. Dizzy. Couldn't walk very far without needing to grab onto something. Yeah, this is what the people on this station need to see of their new marshal as soon as he gets there. Took a day or two before I felt like I could hold down solid food without killing over. Once I was able to walk without assistance, I got a chance to see the station for myself. It's quiet, to say the least. Not sure what makes this a cosmopolitan hub like the guys up top said it was. Whoever took on the project of fixing up the place did a sorely half-assed job. I could do a better job while really hung over and vomiting my guts out. I guess now you're wondering why I took the job. Well, I can't blame my superiors for not seeing that the place is bordering on a ghost station because whoever's in charge here probably lied to them in order to convince them to send their best man for the job, for me to volunteer. A waste. I figured a busy station would mean more work for me. I told you I'll do this till I really can't anymore. Not sure how long I'll be here, but I'll send as many messages as I can. If I really don't feel good when I'm next moved, I might think about being moved to the new Gateway Station. No cryo needed for when I want to come down and visit you and my nephew. How's Micah doing, anyway? Let me know when he marries his girlfriend, the one he has now. Colleen. She's a good girl. Only one who was nice to me last time I visited. If he marries her, I'll let him have my truck, the blazer. It'll be my wedding present. That way he doesn't resort to a fucking minivan if he has kids. I know I haven't really acted like it, but I I really miss you. You're my little sister and always will be. Let me know how things are going. I'll send another message soon. Lots of love. Jethro. March, 2175. Gunnery Sergeant Scott Gorman stepped out into the freezing air from the comfortable warmth of his vehicle. He adjusted his uniform, shivering as he tightened his scarf. Such was spring in the northeast. Cold and wet. I can see why you've told me you don't miss this very much. A woman with shoulder-length hair and bright green eyes huddled next to him. It's chilly and cold and miserable. Putting his arm around his wife, Gorman remained silent. I'm going to miss her, though. They walked out to a sprawling cemetery hand in hand. Grass and flowers were beginning to bloom again. The only sounds were that of chirping birds and the cold breeze. It wasn't very difficult to find his grandmother's headstone. It was one of a couple that were fresh. Grass hadn't begun to cover the soil upturned for burial of the casket just a few weeks ago. His grandfather's was right next to it. Lydia's grip on her husband's hand tightened as they paused in front of the stones. She was a very nice lady, 94 years old, and she insisted on joining everyone on the dance floor at the reception. A grin crossed Gorman's face. You'd think she was going to live forever watching her. I guess I'm just glad she lived a long and mostly happy life. Mostly? God, Scott, she was the happiest granny I ever met, and even that's an understatement. Gorman sighed, seeing his breath in the freezing air. Well, as far as I know, I was the one who helped her become more happy. Always told me I looked so much like her brother. I can remember she'd get really angry whenever Granddad talked about him. I heard two stories about my great-uncle. One was about a man who was stubborn and angry and selfish. The other was about a kind-hearted man who just had difficulty showing his affections and was very lonely all the time. He disappeared about five years before I was born, never heard from again. Apparently, Gran never talked about him, and 
till she started seeing him, Uncle Jethro, and me. Not just in my face, but in the way I acted. Mom always took me out of the house whenever Gran and Granddad had their arguments about Uncle Jethro, so I never... I never really knew that much about him. I thought about asking Gran after Granddad passed a few years ago, but because of my job, I never had the time. Because I never will know the real story now. Jeez, I always had the impression you had the sweetest family in the world. Everyone has their arguments, but... No, Gran wasn't happy all the time, but she was nice to everyone who walked in her door. I guess it's the fact that she was never certain about what ha what happened to her brother that really set her off every time someone talked about him in a negative light. Gorman looked down at the headstone. Anyway, time for goodbye. Thanks for all the memories and love over the years. He stood there for a few minutes, afraid that if he turned, the stone would disappear. Lydia gently took his hand and squeezed it. I'm sorry, Scott. It's okay. It, it'll be okay. Berman massaged Lydia's hand with his thumb. Thanks for coming with me. You shouldn't have to do this alone. Plus, it's my job. Lydia offered him a smile. Even when it's cold and I'm unhappy, your smile makes me feel better. Gorman hugged her. I love you. He kissed her forehead. All right, I guess... I guess we can leave Grand to rest and go somewhere for an early lunch. As the two got back in the car, Gorman let out a heavy sigh when a short flurry of snow struck the windshield. <sighs> Fuck this weather. Lydia smiled. At least you're stationed in South Carolina. Nice down there. I just wish you were with me. If I wasn't up for promotion and a better salary at my job, I'd quit and move with you. I'm really happy having seniority at the store. And if you're happy, I'm happy for you. Are you happy advancing in rank? Yes. Then I'm happy for you, too. We can deal with the distance. Gorman smirked, then the smirk faded. If only Mom didn't keep asking when she's going to see grandkids. We're just not in a good position yet. I'm sorry. You think your mother's annoying? You should hear mine. I have. Why do you think I panic every time she comes over? Well, you're going to have to think of a new panic plan, because she's getting suspicious every time you hide in the bathroom. The snow had turned into a light but very cold rain when Gorman parked in a lot near a cozy-looking diner at the edge of the town, overlooking a vast green field. Kind of reminds me of the little place we ate at when we honeymooned in Ireland, he said. You made the old waitress cry when you placed your order in Irish. She wasn't expecting that at all from a tourist. Free bread every single day for you, Lydia replied. I was not a tourist. I was home. No matter how many generations have passed since your forefathers left Ireland, you are still Irish, and Ireland is your home. Gorman linked arms with Lydia, pulling her close as they walked up the steps to the diner. I told you that. That's right. You did. Several times. It had been a challenge just getting a few days of personal leave. A funeral was one thing. Just visiting a gravesite was another. Still, having just a few days meant a lot, even though they ended quicker than they came. Parting with his wife at the airport was hard. Gorman stood in his uniform, two heavy duffel bags slung over his shoulders, while Lydia held only one suitcase, plus her purse. Their flights to Chicago and Charleston were leaving around the same time, giving them two hours together. I'll be honest, I... Sometimes I feel like I'm failing when, when I can't be with you all the time, Gorman said, an urge to cry suddenly swelling in his chest. Oh, sweetie, no. Lydia put her arms around his neck. You're not failing, I promise. You'll call when you get there, right? Yeah. One of my squad members' contracts is ending, so I have to be there to meet whoever's being transferred in to take his place. He rested his head on top of hers. I'm going to miss you, darling. I'll miss you, too. I'll be thinking of you on St. Patrick's Day. Gorman smiled, despite the tears running down his face. I'll be thinking of you, too. Wishing I could be home cooking for you. Lydia wiped the tears from his face with her sleeve. We'll see each other again soon. Yeah. Gorman kissed her cheek. As soon as I can. Parting became harder as the hours turned to minutes when they both had to go to their gates. They shared one last kiss before Lydia picked up her suitcase and jogged down to her gate.
A heavy feeling latched onto Gorman's heart as he adjusted the straps of his bag before falling into the line of people waiting to get on the plane. He felt lonely. He looked in the direction Lydia had ran and couldn't see her. Then he caught a glimpse of her showing her ticket before being allowed to board the plane. And she was gone. His heart sank into the pit of his stomach. After showing his ticket, he boarded his plane, and once he found his seat, he remained in his head for the duration of the flight down to Charleston. Being this conflicted with himself was often painful. He loved his job. He loved his wife. He can't have both at the same time. She's happy with her job back home, and it would be selfish to ask her to quit in order to move on base with him, take up part-time jobs at every city they travel to, making less than what she was earning now. It wasn't fair or helpful. It could strain the relationship, and that was the last thing he wanted. Twenty-one thirty-five. A surge of nausea came in like a tide. Waits could see it coming, see the water gathering up, and then colliding hard with the shore. He leaned over the railing overlooking Sevastopol's space flight terminals, heart pounding out of fear he'd vomit over the side, probably hitting one of the people below. I probably shouldn't be looking down. Waits straightened his back, taking a breath. There were plenty of restrooms around, but they were all occupied. The last thing he wanted was someone thinking their new marshal was hungover or carrying some virus that could spread to the whole damn station. He could throw up in his apartment. He cursed himself for thinking that the after-effects of cryo had finally faded. Oh, they were still there. All it took was one wrong move, one really bad decision for breakfast. He walked as briskly as he could to a transit station. The last thing he wanted to feel at the moment was self-conscious in front of the Sevastopol residents on the train. They could probably see the nausea in his face, and he looked away. At the same time, looking away gave off the impression that he was unapproachable. That's not how a marshal is supposed to be. How many stops till we get to the residential towers? Waits glanced at a map, then the train came to a screeching halt. His stomach lurched hard. Even after the train had stopped completely to let passengers off, he could feel his insides roiling. Of course, there was no time for things to settle, as the train had pulled away from its stop a few seconds later as hard as it had braked. The train and subway systems on other colonies he had served at were never this rough. Every stop and go seemed to violently churn the contents of his stomach. Finally, the voice on the loudspeaker announced they were approaching the residential towers. Oh, finally! As much as he wanted to push through the crowd to get out, that was not the right thing to do. While he still had a day to adjust before officially going on duty, he figured now was a good time to make the best first impression he possibly could. Despite the waves of horrendous nausea, he let the civilians leave first, following them at the back. The last hurdle was the elevator. Please be empty. Please be empty. Thank God. Waits half slumped in the back of the elevator, gagging. Every slight movement brought about more waves. He could barely read the floor numbers on the buttons or the working Joe Android advertisement posters on the walls. Then again, he wouldn't have minded throwing up on them. The Joes were thoroughly irritating in their own way, not serving much of a purpose other than getting in the way when they repeatedly asked if he needed help. They were antiquated compared to most android models out there. The androids produced by Weyland yutani had their hiccups in the past, but so did most products before they got better and better. Waits had heard rumors before leaving his last assignment on LV-109 that the Jonathan model would be receiving an upgrade but all he'd really heard was the name of the new model, Samuels. Johnny, as he was nicknamed, was genuinely helpful. The one on LV-109 was a real pain in the ass at times, as he was energetic and eager to please literally everyone in the marshal's headquarters. Didn't know how to tell when someone didn't want his help, but he'd be a lot more welcome than the expressionless working Joes. The elevator stopped with a jolt. Waits gripped the railing on the wall to keep from collapsing, walking out of the elevator with noticeable difficulty. Just gotta go down one hallway, and then I can pray to the porcelain god. Are you okay, Marshal? Waits was pulled from his thoughts by the voice of a woman with short, dark hair leaving her apartment. She was giving him a genuinely concerned look. Be polite. As long as you're polite, she's not gonna think they sent a sick man as the new guy. I'm alright, thanks for asking. Are you sure? You look like you're about to be sick. 
I'm fine, just very slow to recover from hypersleep. I see. You must be one of the newer men, because I've never seen you before. I arrived a couple days ago. Jethro waits. Struggling to swallow the ever-increasing nausea, Waits held out his hand. Dr. Lingard. The woman shook his hand in a firm, professional grip. Nice to meet you. Are you positive you don't need anything? I'm positive. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to go vomit and lie down for a bit. You should come down to San Cristobal if you don't feel better in the next two days or so, Marshal. I have some meds that could help. I'll be fine. Before Lingard could say anything else, Waits closed and locked his apartment door. Unable to hold back any longer, he dropped to his knees in the small bathroom, tossing open the lid of the toilet before the muscles in his stomach clenched tightly, sending its contents surging upward. He expected to feel somewhat better when he finished, but upon sitting, he was beset by a splitting headache. Instinctively, he opened the medicine cabinet and gave a disappointed sigh when he realized he had nothing. He'd have to go down to the shops to stock everything. At least, for now, it was quiet. The nausea was over, replaced by a dull aching and clenching sensation. He took a drink of water, a small sip, actually, not wanting to disrupt the peace inside. Maybe taking this job was a mistake. There's nothing here. Probably the most that happens here is petty theft. Waits took a breath. It's still a job. My job. And my job is to keep these people safe. This post will probably be a few months, like the last one, and then... I don't know. I don't want to quit. But Em misses me. She's got a life of her own. A husband, a grown son who should be getting married. I can't have her join me, and I'm not joining her. Not after all that's happened. Not wanting to sit in silence with his thoughts anymore, Waite stood up, then paused. He stood by the window, offering a view to part of the station and the planet it hovered over. Only in a perfect world would he be able to stay close to his sister and do what he loved. It wasn't perfect, though. Most other marshals he had served with had retired or moved to posts closer to their families long before they were at his age. He would go until he was forced to retire. A month ago, he didn't think that would ever happen. After the last couple days, his thoughts had changed a little. Then again, after Gateway Station was unveiled to the world, perhaps that would be his next place. He could be closer to Esmeralda. He wouldn't have to deal with hypersleep. It was something to think about. Seventy-five. Gorman was bounced awake when the plane touched the runway in South Carolina. Rubbing the sleep from his eyes, he sighed as he waited for the plane to stop moving and the attendant to let everyone off. Slinging his duffel bag over his shoulder, Gorman followed the rest of the passengers off the plane and left the airport to find the bus that was supposed to take him back to base. He got on board the vehicle being driven by a uniformed marine, who called, Good afternoon, Gunny! Gorman nodded, not saying a word. He took a seat and tried to mentally prepare himself to return to the marine routine. It was almost sunset when the bus stopped at the base gates. The western horizon was tinged with pink and orange. Gorman stepped off the bus, thanking the driver as he adjusted the strap of his duffel bag. The MPs opened the gates after he displayed his ID. "'Good to see you back, Gunny,' Corporal Valen said when Gorman appeared into his office. "'Everything all right? I'm really sorry about your grandmother's passing.' "'It's fine. You have nothing to be sorry for.' Gorman replied. Missing... missing my wife, that's all. Wish I filled out for more time off. You could have if we didn't have to worry about Hellas's replacement. Fallon gestured to a folder on the table. Command sent the documents for her. They said the timing is perfect because she just graduated boot camp. Gorman opened the folder, seeing the photograph of a very young woman with dark brown hair tied into a small ponytail. She was giving a half smirk, almost as though she was thinking of something mischievous. Garnet Towers, huh? Gorman muttered. General Infantry? Yep. All right, when are they sending her? Tomorrow morning, right after Hallis leaves. Sounds good. We'll have the day to introduce her around and explain the rules and regulations of how this unit operates. Gorman closed the folder. I'm going to take out my laundry, then call everyone down for evening chow. Actually, Gorman paused at the door, turning back to face Fallon. It's Hallis's last night with us. I'm taking us all out to eat. My treat. He was a good kid and deserved something special. <laughs>